Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rusk. And we're here to give you the tools and knowledge to invest both your time and money better. If you're new, feel free to jump in with our Starter Pack series that aired in early 2022 or our Shares or ETF mini series. We've got plenty to share with you in today's episode, but if you want to catch us on socials, head to Rask Australia on Insta and Twitter. I'm also found at Kate Campbell AUS on Insta. And I'm Owen Rask AU on Insta. Just beware of the fake accounts. We'll never DM you about trading strategies or crypto. And if it sounds a bit weird, it's probably not us. And just one final heads up before we get into the show. This podcast contains general financial information only. Chances are you've listened to this podcast for a little while. Of the tens of thousands of people who listen to the Australian Finance Podcast, I know quite a few of you have been coming to our events and have been following Rask for many years. If you have been listening to this show for quite a while, chances are you'll know the name Emma Edwards, otherwise known as Broke Generation. Emma and I recently sat down to record a podcast on the Australian Business Podcast Series. That's our podcast series devoted purely to people that have side hustles, plan to start a business, or already run their business. When we go to events as part of our Rask Roadshow around the country, I think it is the people who listen to the Australian Business Podcast who are most enthusiastic and are most engaged. There's some secret sauce going on over at the Australian Business Podcast because even people who don't own businesses are tuning in. People like managers, leaders in a company, or people who want job promotions. There's a link in the show notes to listen to the Australian Business Podcast. I would absolutely love it if you could leave us a review if you enjoy this series and subscribe to that one. Only a few thousand people actually subscribe to more than one podcast, even though we have four channels. So if you like this show with Emma, jump across there. What you're about to hear is a behind the scenes look at how Emma amassed a huge following on social media, created a business, and how she overcome things like imposter syndrome, which is something we all kind of face in a our own way. But this is a really interesting insight and a look behind the curtain of what goes on inside a content creator's business, some of the trials and tribulations they have to go through. Emma is always refreshing. She is a delight to speak to. You can listen to this podcast here. You can watch it on YouTube, of course, or you can head on over to the Australian Business Podcast and listen to it there. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast featuring Emma Edwards of Broke Generation. Emma, welcome to the Australian Business Podcast. Owen, thank you for having me. It's nice to chat business for a change. Yes, it's super exciting. You've just launched your own business podcast, which is wonderful. You've had some incredible guests on the show so far. So we'll cover that. Mm. Um, You've got a journal, you've got your original, the OG podcast as well. Um, You talk about behavior, you talk about uh, finance, consumerism, and now you've switched gears to talk about business models and how people make money from side hustles and beyond. Today, we're going to talk about what you've learned from your own journey, from the guests you've had on the show, uh, and just as you've gone on in this industry of creating content, uh, marketing, copywriting is your trade. Mm. So 
let's maybe go back. You did an episode on this, which we'll link to um, in the show notes, where you talked about your journey from beginning to end. But maybe if we can do uh, the shorter version of that, the Cliff Notes <laughs> version, if you will, um, you didn't start out doing what you're doing today. So can you take us through that journey? I will try and keep it brief because okay. I think the episode was like an hour and a half. It was. It was. It was over an hour. When I clicked on it, I was like, okay, here we go. And like the first 40 minutes was like all the same bit. And I was like, oh God, but I just left it because I'm chaotic. Um, yeah. So I wasn't, I basically just never had any idea what I wanted to do. And everyone around me knew what they wanted to do. And I was like, mm, okay. I didn't have anybody really in my life that was kind of prompting me to think about that. Mm -hmm. I had a waitressing job and I loved it. And all I wanted to be when I was little was a waitress. <laughs> so I was like, cool, done. Like, I'll just do that then. I didn't have that sort of like guidance on what's possible in life and what you can do if you do different jobs and what different degrees can get you or what not going to uni can get you. Um, so I was in this weird sort of juxtaposition between going to uni because that's what everyone else was doing and the sort of school I was at, it was very kind of built into the curriculum that you submit your, mm. you know, I don't know what the equivalent is here, but you, you, know, you do your personal statement, you put your applications in, everyone's like, where are you applying? And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I kind of like did, didn't did do any of it, just put it all off, classic me. <laughs> and then at the last minute was like, oh my God, I haven't applied to anywhere. So I just like picked somewhere and went, um, which was actually a weird sliding doors moment because the people I ended up living with ended up being how I met my husband. So oh, if I yeah. hadn't had all that chaos, okay, so. I don't know where I would be, it would be a very different um, yeah. outcome. But anyway, um, I ended up putting in an application to study hospitality management because I liked my waitressing job. Um, yep. And then I suddenly, you know, it hit me in the face. I was like, I don't want to do this. But this was the day before uni started. So I did an emergency transfer to any course that they would let me onto, um, which ended up being marketing. Oh, well, wow. Which ended up being pretty well, <laughs> ended up going pretty well for me, really, but not in an intentional way. Um, so sort of skipped through all of that. I ended up sort of working in marketing for a while and I realized that I wanted to, my dissertation tutor had said to me, oh, you clearly have a talent for writing, but this is a research project. So you need to like cut it down. I did not know at that time that I had a talent for writing, as she had said. Um, I knew I liked doing it, but I didn't think that you could do that as a job without doing journalism. Mm. And I didn't have access to those courses because you need to have either connections or be wealthy or get all A's in school, <laughs> yep. which I did not have any of those things. Um, so I thought, oh, I won't do this. But then I learned what copywriting was. So I started trying to be a copywriter. Um, and this was in like the very early days of blogs and things like that. So I tried to get some internships and stuff. And I was living in London at the time, waitressing, like making minimum wage, like the opportunities just weren't coming. So I just started writing a terrible blog online, mm -hmm. <laughs> just to have my words there somewhere. And started sort of writing for other places, like just writing stuff completely for free and being like, can you publish this on your website? So was I had that just links. to build, yeah, build a portfolio, so to speak. Yes, yeah. because I wasn't able to get those like, um, you know, I've worked at this magazine or this magazine because those internships are unpaid. And yeah. unless you can live for free in London, <laughs> if your parents live in London or, or a major city, um, it's just not accessible yeah. to you. Maybe it's different now with the online stuff, but this was like 2013. So you needed to be in the office making coffees for the editor in chief kind of thing. Um, so I did a lot of that and that was kind of, I, I was just getting words online with my name on it. That was the plan and then waitressing to pay the bills. I had a brief stint in real estate, but that's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> that was one of my many nervous breakdowns. Um, then I ended up moving to Australia and I thought, oh, I can't really move to Australia because I knew that I was, I don't want to say behind in my career, but I felt like I was behind in my career. I was like 24. All my friends that knew what they wanted to do mm. had gone to uni and were doing the thing that they planned to do. Mm. I was not doing that. <laughs> mm. um, and so I thought, oh, if I go to Australia, like, is it going to work out? I was moving here to be with who, the guy who's now my husband. But at that time, I had no idea if it was going to work out or not. Um, so I was frantically firing off emails to anything with like copywriting Melbourne on mm. Google <laughs> yep. saying, can I write some stuff for you? Like, do you have any work for me? Can I do an internship? Like, what's it like? Um, and that actually worked out really well for me. So I ended oh, up wow. um, getting some freelance work with both of those companies. Uh, sorry, with two companies that had replied to those emails that I'd sent out. Oh, great. I've been sending these emails for like six months. <laughs> so <laughs> moderately low success rate, but ultimately it got me it got you something. Because, yep. um, you know, I had no connections. I didn't know anybody here. My husband had nothing of use to me, like didn't know anybody that worked in anything. You know, mm. his mum's a teacher and his dad worked in a bank. Like it's not, yeah. <laughs> they didn't have um, endless connections that, you know, would help me get those jobs. Can I ask a question for people that don't know this? I know what this means. Mm. 
but you did cover this in the podcast. Some people will be confused when they hear copywriting. Yeah, okay. What does that mean? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, it's like, so it's not like the legal copywriting that people always think. They think yep. it's like copyright law. Um, all words on packaging the internet products that's copy. Um, text. Yep. Yes, text. So copywriters write all the words you see, whether yep. they're, it's like banners or ads or blogs or to an extent sort of journalism that will be more editorial, but writing words for commercial purposes. And it, because this all contributes, like if you land on someone's website, it all contributes to how people feel and interact mm. with your brand, right? Mm, exactly. Um, but I didn't really have the wherewithal at that time to know that me being, I didn't really know that that's what I was doing with being a copywriter. I was kind of like, oh, cool, I can get paid to write. That probably pays more than being a waitress. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I still didn't really have that visibility over what's really possible in like the creative industry, how the working world is for women in those industries. So I was still, I was kind of like, you know, fumbling my way through being like, oh, I've just got to make some money. I'm in a new country, you know, whatever. But that did get me into freelancing because these companies didn't have, the small businesses didn't have jobs for me. So they said, get an ABN. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> so I got an ABN and so, because I had to have that to be able to earn this money. I found it really hard to get a job when I got to Australia. So I was like, I'll do anything. Like, yeah, I'll take an ABN, fine. Yep. Um, that actually ended up, being, you know, I, I still use that. I've used that ABN ongoing. It's the same ABN that I set up then. So I'm really grateful to be pushed into that because that introduced me to the concept of freelancing, self-employment, um, portfolio career type thing where you mm -hmm. essentially, you are you and you earn your own money through a few different things. Um, and that sort of started it all, all off for me. So I did freelance copywriting and I had also employment jobs as copywriter as a copywriter as well. Um, but I was always doing bits and pieces on the side because my ABM was there and it was like a side hustle mm. thing for me. Um, so that's you know, that was sort of like seven years ago, seven, eight years ago that was happening. God, is it longer than that? No, it's eight years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, through then I ended up starting much more of a business uh, when I started my business, The Broke Generation, which is now the Broke Business Podcast and the Broke Generation Podcast, mm -hmm. um, which was sort of using that skill I had in communication and copy and content, because obviously through being a copywriter over the last decade, it's now evolved into social media and all kinds of other ways of communicating. Um, I've kind of used all of that and packaged it all up to now be working in the financial Mm. conversation, I suppose, um, which is now predominantly where all of my work, whether it's copy, whether it's content or whether it's, um, you know, more education based stuff, um, it's in that niche of personal finance. So it sort of started as being a broad copywriter for lots of things and then niching into being a finance copywriter and then mm. branching sort of back outwards from there uh, to do other things in that field. Did you, um, did you, con cause, because your skill set is quite unique in that being a copywriter and now I would say like a content creator at large because you do much more than just the text that goes on websites or on whatever um, or in you know journals and that type of stuff. Did you do a bit of consulting there? Because I feel like there's so many brands out there that would be interested in that sort of thing. It's always been something that I've thought about doing. Um, something that I know I am quite good at and I'm not that great at identifying things I'm good at. But I come up with creative ideas or creative expressions quite well, which I think probably comes from that skill of communicating. Mm -hmm. um, and at one stage, I did kind of do, want to do a bit of that stuff, but it's cr you know, cracking any sort of new, what would you call it, new offering mm, like service, is quite yeah. difficult. And yeah. I'm noticing this more, I think this is something I learned the longer I'm in business. The more of a, the longer you're in business, the more experience you have and the more of an outward identity you have, particularly if there's any personal branding aspect to that. But you mm -hmm. do also run into the problem of the decisions that you make sometimes can put you in a box. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, particularly if you use social media and you, if you're anything influencer adjacent, which I have been at times, it's not it was kind of accidental, you know, it's quite difficult to intentionally grow a following and and plan a business around monetizing a following because yeah, it's, it's very difficult to do. It's very hard. People think it's easy, but it's very hard. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of people end up there accidentally. But as a result, I think that when you are particularly doing business very organically, doing it on your own, you know, you haven't got investment or maybe money from parents or, or 
connections or anything like that. You kind of got to do what you got to do to pay the bills and take the opportunities that come mm. to you. But then at some point when you take that path over and over again, suddenly you go, oh, I'm here now and people see me this way. So it can actually be sometimes more difficult to sidestep into something else than maybe it would have been to start from the bottom. Yeah. Because people have a preconceived idea of what you do, who you are, what you're good at, what your mm. value is. And so when you've been in one spot, moving over to something like consulting, you kind of need to rebrand yourself a little yeah. bit. And there's that communication piece again. You. But yeah. people see you one way. Um, and that's a difficult thing, yeah. isn't it? To change the brand once it's already established. Exactly. Especially yeah. when the brand is you. Yes. Um, yeah. So why did you call it um, the broke generation? <laughs> Good question. It kind of makes sense because you're talking about finance stuff. Mm. Um, but like, is it because of your experience, like seeing people, dealing with people, your own experience, lived experience? Yeah, it all started from my own experience because I was a quote unquote terrible with money uh, until I was like in my mid-20s. I kind of knew it but didn't know it. It was sort of like I knew I wasn't great with money, but I didn't actually know how much work needed to go into not being good with money. It's like all habits, right? Yeah. We think we can change them whenever we want. Um, I didn't know how kind of deep it was at that time. Um, and yeah, I just kind of, I think I called it that because I felt like, and I still feel like that's kind of our generation's experience, both literally and kind of more metaphorically, like we've broken a lot of ways. <laughs> the system is also broken a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't deep it that much. Like, Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So you've got this business, you do podcasts, you do content creation, um, you've got your journal as well, which I think, from correct me if I'm wrong, is only sold one day a month. Is that correct? Or is that, you have to be on the list kind of thing? Mm, I could be better with this. Okay. <laughs> I had them sold originally. Um, I have this sort of weird quirk with business where I want to do business as ethically as I can. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not into manufacturing scarcity, which I think with a lot of, you know, there's real scarcity in terms of stock when small businesses are doing small runs of things. I understand that. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to use the low stock the small run yeah, to- Yeah, kind of like going out of stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to be like, there's only this many of this. You know, I know it's what business experts would tell you to do, mm. um, but I'm I'm trying to do things a little differently. <laughs> yep. And so I ended up actually splitting it up into drops that are every month because I didn't want people that wanted one to, given, you know, given the environment that the brand is in, I'm trying to help people be good with money. Yep. I didn't want people to have to- buy one mid-pay cycle because they're going to sell out. Yep. So I ended up splitting it so that they are available to buy for a week every month, um, uh, which is also a logistical decision because orders were trickling in, you know, maybe one a week, two a week, two a month. And, you know, because I don't have a huge mm. manufacturing operation, I'm like dragging the journals out my wardrobe, yeah. <laughs> packing one up. And it was sort of a lot of labor. And, you know, there's a very small margin on physical product when you're a small business. Um, so it was kind of a multifaceted decision, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, well, it's really interesting, though, because so for people that aren't, and um, we'll talk about this in a second, for people that aren't uh, marketing people, and mm -hmm. most business owners we've discovered are not marketing people, um, probably don't know this element of scarcity. But mm -hmm. scarcity is the thing that you see when you're at the checkout and it says only three remain, or uh, if you get movie tickets and they're like, you have to do early bird. Mm -hmm. These are all triggers that are proven persuasive techniques in selling. And you've kind of said, I know that, but it's not on brand for me, mm. which is just like, it's a sacrifice in effect mm. because you have to be like, no, I'm true to my brand. Mm. I'm choosing my brand and longevity over the short term shot yes. in the arm from this sale. Mm. So to speak. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. Okay, so... For those that don't understand how these businesses operate, how does your business make money? <laughs> the big question. Other than the journal side. Yeah. Which is yeah, obvious. It doesn't really make money with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. it's. I think 
businesses now where there's an element of social media to pretty much every business out there. Um, I think that business models are shifting and need to shift quite a lot. So it's an interesting question. Mm. Um, I make money at the moment quite scrappily, not going to lie. It's kind of a monetized personal brand um, with also that sort of uh, freelance skill set arm as well. Yeah. So currently I make money through doing freelance copywriting. I've got a few regular clients that I've worked with ongoing. Um, I make a little bit of money sometimes now through brand sponsorships um, on social media, creating content for them. Uh, sometimes brand sponsors on the podcast. And I sometimes, I have in the past sold digital products or workshops or education and things like that. It's kind of all on pause at the moment because I've been sort of going through, not, not a rebrand, but a redirect of the brand. I've been taking study in financial psychology and behavioral finance to sort of niche much more down into that. It was mm. always my angle, but I kind of was much more broad personal finance, whereas I'm trying to steer it much more in that direction now. Yeah, um, and you're already, I would, from my experience, you're already kind of the leader in that field in Australia, which is really cool. It's an emerging field too. It is, yeah, which is both good and bad. Um, when it's a path that hasn't been trodden, mm. there's opportunity there, but there's, especially, like I said, when you're doing it, you know, you're really on your own. You're not, you haven't got sort of guidance really from anybody or mm. any business experience or a parent that's ever on a business. Like my dad was the lowest level cop you could be and my mum had like, uh, say, like kind of, she was in a few pyramid schemes and that kind of thing. But anyway, <laughs> like there's nobody really yep. that I can tap into that knowledge of. Like I've got a few friends and like their mums run businesses or their dads have always been self-employed electricians or something. Um, I feel like I haven't had a lot of, I feel like I'm winging it a lot of the time, yeah. um, which I think a lot of people are. Mm. But we have to make it look like we're not as well, yeah. um, which is hard. But yeah, when there's a path that's not been trodden before or you're deviating from a path, whether it's working in an emerging field, whether it's trying to sell ethically, whether it's trying to do anything differently. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's scary, mm. but it's also, it feels good when you know you're doing something in alignment with your values. I come across so many businesses that need help with this type of thing, just generally, not necessarily in the finance genre, but um, understanding how people feel when a website is presented to their customers or like their social media channels. They know they need to do it, even physical, like in-store type products. Um, basically, everyone needs to have this these days. You need to have a presence online, a presence on the, the key social media channels. And so many businesses don't know how to do that. Mm. And I think we're talking off air about how uh, business owners really struggle to shift from I can make the thing, that's the technician, to I can sell the thing. Mm. And um, it's almost like the more technical you are, the more technically brilliant you are, it's almost like it's orders of magnitude more difficult to be the seller of that thing. Because mm. you, you come up and you go, here's my widget and look at all the features and here, 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 because you think that's important. But the customer's like, I don't know, does it do the thing that you say? Mm. <laughs> like, sell, like, tell me what it does for me, mm. not like everything that's got with it. And um, I feel like that's where you definitely have an advantage in the space like just generally speaking, mm. with your podcast, the new podcast I'm specifically talking about, business podcast, mm. you've interviewed some amazing people. Mm. Um, like Tony was on the Tony <laughs> Lodge and I was just like, wow, like awesome. Um, what have you pieced together from that so far? So just to give listeners a bit of context about the types of episodes that I wanted to record and types of conversations I wanted to have around business, the sort of tagline for Broke Business is the money podcast for business owners. Because as we said off air before recording, most of us don't really know what we're doing and we're mm. sort of trial and erroring all the time and money stuff is a huge thing for that. And there's a huge crossover between your personal finances and your the way you run a business, um, both emotionally and also practically. So I wanted to have two different types of conversations on the podcast. I wanted people to learn things about business and money in business because they're intrinsically linked, right? Mm. Um, we're in business to make money in some mm. capacity. Um, so there's some episodes where, you're, where I wanted to have either a solo episode myself or a guest expert on where the aim is to learn something. So we had a pricing expert on who was talking to us about how to price yourself, <laughs> your products, your services, um, particularly when there is that kind of 
gray area between like, oh, I'm pricing my product, but I'm pricing myself and like, what's my worth? And she talked us through loads of sort of, um, particularly, she works with a lot of freelancers or service providers. Which is so hard if you're in that space. Oh, it's so yeah. hard, especially as as you grow because you might start much more junior but then you need to not only change your pricing but redefine the relationship between you and the person you're serving so if you work with big businesses you've got there's a whole spectrum of places you can sit in terms of the role you're playing like are you effectively an employee with no super mm. as a freelancer which when you're junior you might be but as you get more experience, you can't just keep that relationship and slap a higher price on it. You need to shift more into that expert consultant providing a service. Mm. The way you communicate is different. The way you price is different. The way that the things that you allow to like receive from that client is different. So that was a really good one of those like learning something episodes. I also wanted to have people on there to talk about how they feel about the money that they make through self-employment. Um, so I had Tony Lodge, who's a much loved podcaster on yep. the Tony and Ryan podcast. And we just kind of talked about what it's like to make money through being a personal brand, make money being funny. You know, it's not, mm. I talk about this a lot through the lens of the last couple of years. You know, through the pandemic, our lives were split into essential and non-essential. If you're an essential worker, it mattered. Anything that was non-essential, cut. Yep. And so- I do. I don't think I haven't heard a lot of people saying this, but it's something that I definitely felt. I'm abundantly aware that what I do doesn't actually matter when the world is under threat, um, and I wanted to talk to. You know, I, I thought that you know Tony, Tony talked a lot about. She makes money by being funny, and she's like, "What if somebody comes along and says you're not funny? What if what if someone takes it all away from me because mm. I make money by being funny?" And um, that was really interesting because she talked, you know, she'd recently released a book. So we talked about a chapter in her book where she always wanted to be famous hmm. and it's not very becoming, you know, to yeah. admit that you want to be famous. And that might be something people experience. What happens when you actually get famous and your whole livelihood comes from being famous, Yeah. Um, especially in like the fleeting sort of um, world of social media where you can get fame very, very quickly through a very non-traditional method and what goes on behind that you know people see that one video went viral and then you were really famous but how many other failed attempts did you have like what happens underneath all of that um so there were sort of two different types you're either learning something or you're kind of really hearing someone's experience sometimes a bit of both mm. um but i think that money in business is like it's talked about a lot but it's also not mm. um we hear very extremes on social media you know making 10 20 30k months or six figures seven figures um you know and six figures itself is a very broad term you can make 100k which is not a lot of money or you could be making 900k it's still six figures yep. so it's sort of there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and i wanted to yeah just have a space to have conversations about money um that not that we're negative, even though that some can sometimes come out because mm. sometimes there's no space to be to explain the struggles that you're having because you have to look like you're doing really well all the time. Um, but also just for people to share their experiences and kind of take the curtain down mm. of actually how you make money when a lot of work you have to do in your business is not revenue generating. How has it changed your opinion of what you do? Or like how has it made you reflect on your day to day because I'm speaking with a lot of business owners at the moment and they're wonderful people and they're super entrepreneurial, creative, risk taking and it's also helped me reflect on my own worth and what I can do to help them. Mm. So I'm curious how you've, because you're in a very similar situation to me, right? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you've reacted to that. Mm. Um, I think this answers your question. I've noticed personally and reflected a lot on things that I do that obviously come from, that are obviously, I don't want to say like limiting beliefs or blocks or something, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, everybody has them in some way and For I sure. work with them a lot in a money sense. So the things that we believe about money and how it informs our behavior. Business is really similar and I have noticed that as I've sort of got to a point where I want to start growing and you know maybe I'm making as a sole trader, like a salary, 
as if I had a job. But, you know, how do you get to that next bit? Do I want to have people working with me? Like, how does that all work? How do you sort of um, optimize your time rather than just kind of, like I said before, clawing through and taking the opportunities that come to you? How can you be a bit more intentional with it? And Mm. how can you sort of pay someone to do that for you so that you can free that up? Um, I've noticed that I have a quirk of making things a lot harder than they need to be for myself in order to feel deserving of it. Um, so certain projects or certain ways of getting to places, I have a big thing about, I don't deserve it unless I've done it myself. And a big thing about, I don't deserve it unless it's been created from scratch. And there's a lot in business and scale in terms of repurposing or optimizing or, you know, taking a workshop and maybe delivering it 20 times. That really sits funny with me Mm. and... It makes me feel I'll. It feels like I I can't be deserving of growth or success or whatever whatever that looks like at that point, unless I've gone the real hard way around. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because yeah. I see I, I see a lot of people. You know, you see people succeeding, and you're like, okay, it's possible. There's a market. They've done it. This is how they've done it. But the block I always come up against is I'm like I couldn't have someone doing my content. What if someone found out that it wasn't me? Yeah. When it's like, well, really, you don't get paid to make content, so getting help with that is probably a good thing. Um, but so it's then, that struggle between optimizing yep. and kind of this internal value that you have, this set of values almost. S- sort of, but it's also like, like it's a weird sort of sense of narcissism. I'm like, it has to be done by me. I can't possibly make money off of something that someone else has done. I can't for some reason see that... Or, you know, um, you know, you get a lot of certain opportunities you get when you're visible online come from the fact that people find the work that you do. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, I didn't really earn that because I only got that because I have a podcast or I only got that because I have a following on social media. But someone else will go, or if a friend said that to me, I'd be like, but you built the following on social media. But mm. I'm like, well, yeah, but, you know, I I go the hard way. Like I, I struggle with repurposing content or... Um, you finding a revenue stream in something that's easy. Like I always make it so much harder than it needs to be because in my mind there's some weird block thing that mm. it has to be hard in order to be worth it. Do you think – I feel like some other – many other business owners would feel the same mm. um, because I feel that way sometimes too. Like mm. when I found out that some books were – like books were ghostwritten, I was like, what do you yes. mean ghostwritten books? Exactly How this. can it be a biography? <laughs> like, And yeah. all these types of things. And I'm like, this doesn't make a lot of sense if there's no contribution from – or like very little contribution from the authors or whatever. I'm not mm. saying that that's for everyone. But I was like, this is a bit surprising and concerning to me. So I was like, that, that can't happen. Mm. Um so I, I feel like there's so many people out there that feel the same. Mm. How do you think then, like, how do you cope with that? Like, have you come across any strategies to cope with it? Um, well, I've started, I've had, I've worked with coaches over the years mm-hmm. and I've had a bit of a gap from it due to financial constraints, yep. <laughs> but I'm going back to it now. And I think that it's helpful with those things because a coach or a psychologist or somebody or a mentor will question you on those things and sort of also help you understand that that's what it is. Like for a long time, I didn't understand that that's what it is. Um, But I do like it's it's also now I know that that's what I am doing. You can actually do something with that. Whereas for a long time and even still now, my brain will collect evidence that things are easier for everybody else and not for me, Mm. Um, which if you want to strip it all back, maybe sometimes that's actually true, but it's because I am have this belief that it has to be difficult. Um, and so mm. I've kind of, I'm not quite sort of through it yet, but what I'm having got to the way that I am causing that, you know, privilege exists. Some people do get things easier than you That's, and I yeah. get some things easier yeah. than other people. Um, but I also am perpetuating that myself yep. by making everything really difficult and kind of going, oh, well, I won't reuse that workshop I've already done and change it for this new audience. I'll just start from scratch. And it's like... Are you kidding? <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a perfectly great workshop and it's different. But like that's how – it's like when you said about ghostwriting. I felt the same, one, when I found out about ghostwriting, and two, when I found out that like the best speakers in the world that get paid tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to speak, they have like three talks and they just do them over and over again. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I wouldn't feel worthy enough of that money if 
I wasn't creating something new every time. Mm. But it's like you can't just go up there and like that, that's how you scale a personal brand. Yeah. That's how you can make that money with just you. Um, and it doesn't even need to be at that scale. You could be getting paid 500 bucks to speak, but it makes sense that you refine, refine, refine. It's like comedians. Yeah, they use the same the, material yeah. over and over again. Um, that's just how it works. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that was a long way around. But I think for me, working with somebody that can question that in me and, and identifying the role that I am playing in it, I'm working on changing the way that you see things because you can see, and I'm always nervous about speaking about this, uh, you know, in a silo because you, you know your thoughts, your your thoughts are not what causes hardship, absolutely not. Um, but sometimes, you know, with everything, whether it's business, money, food, anything, our brains will create a story about that, and that mm. becomes the story, and then that is the lens through which we see everything. Yeah. Um, so, so I'll that see confirmation, friends. Confirmation bias. Hundred percent coming out. Yeah. I've got friends that are, you know, work in a similar field to me and they'll just go out and do stuff. And I'll be like, I could never, because I know that I'd make an absolute pig's mess of it mm. trying to earn it for myself. Someone will come and say to me, oh, I'll give you, I don't know, I'll pick a number, uh, five grand to like, like, imagine this happened. In my mind, this is what I want to happen. I want someone to come up to me and go, I'll pay you five grand to run that workshop we ran last week tomorrow to my employees. Yeah. In my mind, that's what I want because I want to make money more easily. But I know if that happened, I would not feel like I deserved it. I'd feel like, oh, they just gave me that because of, mm. you know, whatever. I have to make an absolute mess and have like 15 breakdowns because then I've earned it. Yeah, crazy, isn't and it? And that's the biggest block for me, I think, in getting to that next point. You know, for you always, in a way, it's a good thing. You know, you achieve things and then you want the next thing and the next thing. But for a long time, I just wanted to be able to freelance full time. You know, I did it on the side for so long. And over the last, I left my job 18 months ago to do this full time. And, you know, at first your goal is just make enough to pay your bills. And that's where I am. And now I've got to get to the next bit. Mm. And I think money wise, coming from somebody who started with no savings, with debt, with absolutely no understanding of really the point of saving money or being good with money. I didn't know that financial confidence or freedom or whatever existed at that time because I'd never seen it before. Getting to the point where you're not, like getting out of struggle is one thing. Getting to a point where you're thriving is an in entirely different challenge, whether it's personally or in business. And I think if there's a business component, it's even more of a different kettle of fish. Mm. And you almost need to do all the work you did to get out back up to zero to do, yeah. you need to do it all again in a different way to get to the next point and then, and then probably up and up again. Um, yeah, which I, I hear think you. is huge in business. I hear you. And uh, business owners can relate to this. Like mm. I'm relating to this. Now, I think that, I think that I'm about maybe a year and a half ahead of you in that journey. Mm. Because I dealt with this for so, so long. Like mm. your, your website says a destination for hot mess millennials. I probably was a hot mess in terms of like the business and trying to do so many things and being really worried about things. Like so, how many business owners do you come across who are like so worried about every croissant that gets made by their baker? And you're like, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. You have bakers that do that. But you know that like, and you've trained them. Mm. Like they're going to make mistakes, sure, but it's okay. Um, and I, that's what, and we talked about this recently over lunch. Like I just, my cycle which I've talked about before and business coach just changed my life with mm. that not because they knew business it was actually just because they <laughs> helped me realize that hold on a second like you're worth something first of all what you've built is great mm. and second of all take pride in like making money mm. like don't just like stick your head in the sand like actually take pride in it and I, I can I feel like I can see that for you mm. oh yeah I I hope so it's just it's really you gaslight yourself it's conflicting because you want you know on some level you want to make more money and you want to make more money more easily. Mm. But then you literally get in your own way because of things that are unrelated to that. And that in itself causes anxiety because those two things completely com contradict one another. Um, but yeah, you're right. Having someone that can call it out of you and which I think is what coaches are really great at and get you to move through it. Mm. Um, otherwise, you just keep hitting up against the same wall. But you, and, and you get exposure to this now with the, the I know you don't, did the limited um, series for the business podcast, but I could feel like there's something like a lot more there. You got that exposure because you got to see other people's journey as well. Mm. And even though it's not like reflected back at you, you're kind of having these moments where you're like, huh, mm. like the, the pricing thing, you're like, that makes sense. Yeah. 
Uh, Monique, who's off air, he actually told me about something uh, in the creative field maybe a year or two ago where um, freelancers would submit their prices mm. and then there was like hundreds of them that ended up doing it. So then everyone could see what the market was, Yeah, which is for pricing is such an incredible thing. Yeah. Where did I see that? I think I saw something similar. Monique, off air. Uh, <laughs> remember what it was called. Can't remember now. what it is, but we'll find it <laughs> yeah. and we'll stick it in the show notes. And they did it for influencers as well, I think, during COVID. Oh, right. Um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, there was lots of layers to it. There was real great benefit for other people to see, but, it, you know, it also uncovered a lot of racial bias and that kind of thing, which is really interesting. I think for me, interestingly, one of the most humbling is not the word, but I've had two instances in my freelance endeavours where women working at the company that I've been freelancing to, same co- same sort of company actually, they're sort of affiliated together, but these, these two instances were completely isolated. Twice they've said, resubmit your quote and make it higher <laughs> because you're under quoting. Um, and that is, you know, obviously they work for the business. It's not their business. You know, some business owners will be like, well, I can't afford that. If they've set their prices, that's what it is. And, I, you know, I completely both things can be true in that situation. Um, but I think that it is really helpful if you have an opportunity to tell someone they're undercharging to tell them. Yeah. Um, because to me, I was like, oh, my God, will they pay that? It was like an article rate. Um, and I put in 440 uh, an article, which... That was mm. the most I'd ever charged for an article ever. And they were like, charge more than that. And I was like, okay, how? Like, I'm like, 441. <laughs> like, no, more like 550. And I'm like, okay, thanks. Like, yeah. it's really helpful when someone gives you that, yeah. um, opens that door for you. Because, and I, I hope I can pass that on to somebody else. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's, nobody tells you that you're undercharging. Mm. It's really hard. And you don't know you're undercharging. And especially like for me, what they said was undercharging. I was like, they're going to think I'm so greedy, (laughs) which is a massive, another. that's a whole other story. But yeah. Yeah. I I haven't followed you for a few years. Uh, Get the privilege of seeing you kind of grow Mm -hmm. as you do what you do. And um, from like the point of stepping off and doing this full time, uh, building the brand up the way you have, I think it's, I think it's really cool. And I think it's great um, that you've shifted focus for a little while to do the business podcast Mm -hmm. um, because I think there are so many people from micro businesses up to like CEOs that really are like kind of faking it, so Mm -hmm. to speak, until they make it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And fair enough, Mm -hmm. it's fine. But um, you are kind of like talking about this openly and honestly, which is Mm -hmm. is really cool because a lot of business owners feel this, but they just don't express it. Yeah. And it's especially with that social media lens, you I've noticed this a lot lately, actually, as I've met people sort of that I've known online, offline. The two, you know, some people do it deliberately for sure, but the two often something that looks like it's going really well, or people will say to me all the time, you're my goals, like you're doing so well. And I'm like, (laughs) do you want to have a look at my accounting software? Like (laughs) it's a real struggle over here, but you don't always see it. And not only do you not see it, you're, especially those stories I was saying before, you perceive things a certain way. Like there I am saying, oh, you know, I see people getting things really easily or doing things really easily. There's an element of truth to it, but it's also a story that I'm creating. I don't know what they're battling with as well. Um, So I think just honest conversations are really helpful. So maybe just to wrap up and put a bow on this, people can go and listen to uh, Broke Business, which um, will be in the show notes once again, and and hear more of these stories and uh, educational kind of lessons that you walk through. Um, I'm curious, like you've been doing this for a while now, what's something that you would tell yourself if you were starting again? I would tell myself or anyone else that's starting again to look for the things that you are good at and learn more about why you're good at them. So mm. there's a there's a bit of a celebrate your wins in that or unpick your wins, for example, because we, we skip over all that, don't we? You know, mm. oh, oopsie, but now I'll just carry on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you, you focus on the failures so much. But also being open to other people telling you what you're good at, I think, particularly. Yeah, that's so important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. like we dismiss it so quickly. Like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, or, yeah, oh, it's just a thing. Yeah, oh, I only got to accept a following. Or, oh, no, 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 no. Whereas yeah. actually what, a bit like I said, I know I'm good at coming up with ideas and I know I'm good at writing copy. What often, you know, I often think, oh, I just got lucky on social media. People go, how did you build your following? I go, I got lucky. 
And to a degree, there is luck. You know, there's a lot of people making great content that it just doesn't get seen or the market's saturated or whatever. But mm. also, well, also, I think I'm actually quite good at putting into words what's in people's minds. Mm. And how do I know that? Because people regularly comment, are you in my brain? So <laughs> actually, you know, it's funny, but also that comes up regularly. So there's obviously something there. Then you actually, because there's a lot of the things that we do, especially when it's that core thing that we're good at, like you talked about, that main thing that we do. And, you know, we mm. have to figure out the rest because we do it on our own. We do that so intuitively that it seems like nothing, but that's, there's so much skill in what you do in, intuitively. Mm. So I'm, Great at written communication. Video, not so much. I <laughs> written communication. Oh, thank you. But like my thing is putting into words things that people are thinking, things that people can understand, things people are feeling. And that, you know, spreads to various things that I do. But asking people what you're good at and taking notes from what people say to you rather than just being like, oh, no, 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 no I didn't really do that. Because mm. the same things that come up over and over again probably mean something and that can really help with that worth thing I'm finding because when you do it intuitively it's easy to think that you don't know anything and you're just winging it and you're just an imposter and you know imposter syndrome is such a huge thing but when you actually understand what you're good at and start believing that you're good at it as if it was someone that mm. you knew or someone in your mm. family um, yeah I think I'd go back and say that because yeah for so long I thought I was just winging it and even now I still think I'm winging it and I'm like oh my god because I didn't do journalism or I didn't do writing at uni really like a lot of people have done the cert for in writing and editing I didn't do any of that and I went to an editing class once as part of a job I had and I was like oh my god I don't know any of this like does everyone think I know this oh my god I'm lying <laughs> but it's like but I know something else you know like yeah yeah <laughs> that's such a good thing I never so Something that I see a lot of business owners do is like um, they'll have an idea in their mind. This is the thing that I've created. This is it. This is going to work. And then they t have like the blinkers on. Mm. They don't see that like right beside them. There's another lane, mm. which is the customers are telling you, "Can you do this thing?" And you're mm. like, "Oh no, no, it's this thing." Mm. No, there's that thing right there. Look at that gold mine. But this is another way to do that. Is not just like listen to your customers, mm. but it's actually listen to the other people who will evaluate you. It sounds yeah pretty crude, yeah, but like it's like. What do they think about what you're yes. good at, right? They, they're telling you. Listen to what the market says to you. Listen to what your customers say to you. Listen to what your peers say to you. Like, this is a really literal example, but if anyone has like a physical uh, business, it might be interesting. There's a cafe near me that my friend and I love. And when they first opened, they did amazing savoury pastries. They make all the pastry in-house. It's amazing. They did this cream cheese and jalapeno escargot. Oh, wow. It was stunning. And they did a potato and leek Danish. Never had anything like that before. Amazing. They suddenly stopped doing it. And we and other people on social media have asked them over and over and over again to please bring it back. And they, you know, maybe there's a logistical reason, but I can't really think of one. They keep being like, watch this space, watch this space. And I'm like, <laughs> why won't you give people what they want? People are telling you, you are amazing at this. Yeah. But then I go there and they've got rows and rows of sweet pastry that you can literally, you know, maybe it's slightly better, but you can get a chocolate croissant anywhere. Mm. What you can't get is a cheese and jalapeno escargot. But mm. your whole market is telling you how good it is. Yeah. And it's like maybe you tease it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and then you make a big relaunch, but you don't. Like you have to, I feel like there's two things there. Listen, but then also tell people what you're doing. I see this all the time with people not using social media properly. There'll be something amazing on and, and or often I'll be, you know, um, you know, people use social media a lot with cafes or events and stuff like that. And you go to the social media, they haven't posted for eight months or it's a long weekend and you don't know if they're open. I love that. That's and the thing like, that I always tell go to. people what you are offering them and <laughs> yeah. how they can get it. Yeah. I see that all the time. I see these businesses. And I'm like, the first thing I do, are they open on a public holiday? Yeah. Go to Instagram, go to Facebook, mm -hmm. go to their website. You don't see it. And you're like, OK, well, I guess I just yeah. got a call. Yeah. Who knows? And that's, you know, I'd rather die. Yeah. <laughs> just call. Come yeah. on, I'm not going to call. I'll just yeah. find someone that has posted that they're yeah. open. Like, come on. Yeah. Well, um, people should get in touch with you. Um, Emma from The Broke Generation. Uh, all the links will be available in the show notes. They can listen to the podcasts, uh, get in contact with you and see how you present your website. Because I think you said it needs a refresh. I think it's exceptional. Thank you. Um, so you can check out how, how the pros do it. Um, Emma, thanks for coming in the studio. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Sorry about ranting about the escargot. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. We hope you learned something new and were able to take one thing away from this episode. If you're keen to learn more, head on over to Rask Education and take one of our free money and investing courses. You could even become a Rask Core member for less than your Netflix subscription each month. And don't forget to subscribe for new episodes in your inbox every week. Plus, if you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and send any questions our way via the link in the description. And before we go on, did this podcast contain personal financial advice just for me? Absolutely not, Kate. Our podcast actually contains general financial information only. What that means is the information does not take into account your financial needs, goals, objectives, or even your situation. So because of that, it's important that you consider if the information is appropriate to you and your needs before acting on it. If that all sounds a bit confusing or you're still working out what your needs are, it's a great idea to consult a licensed and trusted financial planner. And don't forget to do your own research. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.